Hello there. In this week's Data Radio Show, we're going to be asking what happens if you don't have experts when it comes to getting advice on your data management. We're going to catch up with Richard Harris, not the Richard Harris from the Harry Potter movies that would require a time machine or a Ouija board. And we're going to take a look at some of the latest news, including what Apple is doing with AI. All that and more coming up now on the Data Radio Show. Welcome to episode 11 of the Data Radio Show. We've got a really exciting episode coming up for you. At the end of the episode, we're going to look back at a clip from, I think it's 2022, uh, from a masterclass that we did as part of the Data Vault Innovators community. And it's completely free to go join the community, jump onto the link that's popping up on the screen right now. It's also linked in our bio down below. Go and join the conversations. It'd be really interesting to get your perspective on some of the news pieces that we've got coming up. Also in this episode, we're going to have a catch up with Richard Harris. He's a consultant who works in Australia around data management and data upgrades for big business and government organizations. It'll be really good to get his perspective on, well, pretty much everything. And also find out about that awkwardness with the fact he shares a name with a now deceased Harry Potter actor who played Dumbledore originally. Maybe, we might get into that if we've got the time. And of course, we've got the news coming up soon with some really interesting stuff here from Apple, who have been a little bit of a late runner when it comes to AI. It'd be really interesting to see what they're working on at the moment. So, I guess let's go jump into the news. Madeline Ricciutio from Laptop Mag reports on Apple's new AI modeling system called RealM, or Reference Resolution as Language Modeling. It's expected to compete with OpenAI's GPT systems. RealM will make interactions with virtual assistants like Siri more intuitive as the AI system can see and interpret on-screen content. RealM is a small language model, so it's less complex than large language models like GPT, which makes it faster at on-device tasks than larger models which require more computing power. This language model, according to researchers from Apple AI, is a better option for gleaning information from screenshots and other on-page images like recipes, phone numbers and surrounding sounds. Released as a preprint research paper, the model essentially offered a new method for using AI-generated data and labels to speed up training of new models, including Siri 2.0. The method speeds up performance and reduces the number of follow-up prompts needed to get desired results. Being able to improve prompt understanding and get to a desired output with as little interaction with the AI as possible is perfect for consumer tech especially in Siri, which will be used by a wide group of people with varying degrees of technological prowess. Apple is something of a dark horse in the AI revolution, so it'll be interesting to see how and where they roll out generative AI. The preprint paper is actually available in the link in the description below, and don't forget to jump over to the community forums at DVIC to get involved in the conversation on this. Cognition AI's Devon has been making news over recent weeks. Positioned as the first AI software engineer capable of outperforming ChatGPT in side-by-side -side comparison of coding capability, Devon is purpose-built to plan, execute, and debug code using tools like a command line, code editor, and a browser. In early demos, it successfully built and deployed a fully styled website, showcasing advanced reasoning and long-term planning capabilities. Some additional use cases include Devon learning how to use unfamiliar technologies based on reading a blog post. Devon can learn how to use a program to produce, for instance, images. It can build and deploy apps end-to-end -end, such as a website and incrementally adds features requested by a user, then deploys the site. Another and most promising capability is that it can autonomously find and fix bugs in code bases. If you haven't already, you can check out the Cognition Labs announcement page, which is linked in the bio below. And finally, something a little different this week. We're recommending a good listen for those interested in the impact of AI on our collective fortunes. The New York Times reporter and podcaster Ezra Klein interviews Nalay Patel in this podcast episode called Will AI Break the Internet or Save It? Discussing how today websites are filled with slapdash content can taunt it just to rank highly in the algorithm, along with how Facebook, YouTube, X slash Twitter, and TikTok all used to feel more fun and surprising, and how great swathes of once great media companies have been folding or laying off a lot of staff members unable to find a business model that seemingly works. 
In this conversation, Klein and Patel talk about why platforms seem so unprepared for the storm of AI content. Whether it's an internet filled with cursory AI content is better or worse than an internet filled with good AI content. And if AI might be the kind of cleansing fire for the internet that enables something new and better to emerge. It's well worth a listen for anyone that has an interest in the quality and quantity of information we find in the digital world how it shapes our collective thinking and shapes public discourse. You can find a link to the podcast below in the description uh, or wherever it is that you find podcasts like this one. Hopefully this is one of the other podcasts that you listen to. And that's it for the news this week. Be sure to like, comment and subscribe and have your say as a community member over at the Data Vault Innovators community. And please follow the links that are in the description below. Now for a quick word from our sponsor, We Escape. Wearscape helps IT organizations leverage automation to design, develop, deploy, and operate data infrastructure faster. More than 1,200 customers worldwide rely on Wearscape automation to eliminate hand coding and other repetitive time-intensive tasks to deliver data warehouses, vaults, lakes, and marts in days or weeks rather than months or years. Wearscape has global operations in the US, UK, Singapore, and Aotearoa New Zealand and can be found online at wearscape.com. Right, now that the news is out of the way, let's jump over to our interview. Today I'm sitting down and chatting with Richard Harris. Richard's actually a a consultant who works with large organizations and government departments across Australia to help them update their AI data and everything else that they have to deal with when it comes to, well, pretty much everything because that's what they run on. And in a world where there's changing laws and rules around what data is acquired and what you can do with it, and it's shaped by places like Europe and its GDPR or California's new privacy laws, it's a really fascinating time to be somebody who's working in this field, particularly as somebody who's gone out on their own to try and make their way in the world. So let's go and catch up with Richard now. Thank you very much for joining me for this. Um, Would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? Uh, Sure thing. My name is Richard Harris uh, with Data Design Consulting, uh, providing uh, advice, guidance and training in the areas of privacy, policy and procedure, specifically, you know, with adherence to Australian privacy principles, GDPR and the like. How did you get into that? Um, fairly long journey. I, um, I got into the data field about 25 years ago. I was working with a company that had a pretty clever, uh, solution for stripping out data from print files and repurposing them in terms of how you look at data. And that sparked my interest in, the, in the data space. Um, and um, my first venture to do my own thing was an organization that looked at uh, nonlinear relationships in complex data systems, effectively applying the six degrees of Kevin Bacon idea to data. How do you link information? Uh, and we were looking at fraud prevention at the time. The disappointing thing was uh, uh, not many insurers at the time were keen to invest in that area because they build the cost of fraud into their premiums anyway. So, um, but that really sparked my interest in the power of data. So I made a deliberate move into, into an organization that specialized in data management and um, started my journey then. And really over the course of the last 20, 25 years, I've always worked in areas where um, we're working with clients who are using personal information predominantly for marketing and communications, but also for analytics and reporting, business intelligence. And the through line throughout my entire career really has been data privacy. Um, You know, when you're building a database, the using personal information, uh, the first consideration is making sure that information is is protected, uh, making sure that you've got the right policies and procedures in place, that you're not using it in an unethical manner, et cetera. So I had the opportunity last year to to start my own business. And, uh, and to me, that was where there was a big gap in the market. Uh, lots of organizations have done a real good job of investing in cybersecurity. But the, where we see the big privacy breaches it has all been linked to human error, which ultimately links back to either they didn't have the right policies and procedures in place. All those policies and procedures weren't being followed. So, for me, you know, that's that's you know how I, I landed here. I basically spent 
you know, t- over two decades having to comply with privacy regulations. Um, and, uh, and for some reason, I've always, you know, had a, a firm eye on, you know, the ethical use of data and, and data protection and, and, and all the things that go along with that. So that's how I landed here. 25 years, a lot has changed in how data works, privacy laws, stuff like that. What sort of advice would you give yourself if you were starting now? Um, I think if I was starting now, um, it would be looking for ways to arm yourself about the pace of change um, because we are seeing you know, a, a big evolution. Uh, you know, when I started, you know, the internet was still in its infancy. Uh, email was a was a new thing. I mean, I was still working with data to run direct mail and sometimes even fax campaigns. That's how old I am, <laughs> despite my boyish good looks. Um, of course. So we've seen that evolution and it's the pace seems to be picking up. We're now in the world where, you know, even email is a bit passe and we're now in the area of messaging and very quickly approaching the world of artificial intelligence. So I think making sure that you have the ability to um, stay up to date and absorb that pace of change and also getting very comfortable with ambiguity. Um, you, we're never going to know what's going to happen now in three, five God forbid, 10 years' time. Those days have long gone. Um, so we have to be comfortable with the idea of, of really making decisions and, and moving forward in a way that maybe we don't know everything, but we know enough. And the idea of um, sort of human error that you mentioned before got me wondering, you share a famous name with um, a Harry Potter <laughs> actor. Has yeah. that ever actually cropped up? in terms of, of the work that you've done and people sort of mistaking it to you, two of you in some way? No one's ever mistaken me for Dumbledore, I can assure you. Okay. Um, but yeah, it, it's an easy way for people to remember my name when I introduce myself. Is um, it a great tool though, to be able to say, look, this is, this could be something that's really basic human error, you know, two people with the same name. No, that's not the human error I'm talking about. I'm talking mm-hmm. about, um, I'm talking about when we see a breach. So a, a good example that I use um, quite often is um, Medibank. Everyone is familiar with the Medibank breach of a few years ago. Um, in that uh, case study, we know that the breach happened because someone had uh, someone had obtained username credentials to get into the Medibank system. That speaks to a level of human error because somebody would have to have taken steps to reveal that. Now, it was probably done through a sophisticated phishing exercise. But again, if that person had been properly trained, if there were other systems in place, policies and procedures, then maybe that wouldn't have happened. But it wasn't just the fact that the systems were breached through that manner. There was also a significant amount of past customers' data that was breached. Under the regulations, you are expected to delete information that you no longer need. So again, a very good argument that policies and procedures weren't being followed, or maybe they didn't exist, because that data really shouldn't have been um, available at that point. At the very least, it should have been archived or de-identified. And that's resulted in a very significant impact on Medibank, you know, $250 million in their capital fund, uh, additional, um, not to mention the close to a little over $100 million in remediation, 15% drop in their share price. Um, But the big kicker is that there's now a a class action lawsuit being mounted because uh, people are stating that their privacy policy was saying that they were doing certain things that they clearly were not doing. Um, and so, you know, from, a, from an example of just how bad uh, human error can result, <laughs> many banks up there. But that's consistent across the board. Um, Football Federation, DP World, Pareto Phone, the, the list kind of goes on and on where when it comes down to it, 
people not following policies and procedures was the was the problem. Um, World Economic Forum puts that the the number at I think ninety three percent of data breaches can be linked back to some form of of human error. So when people talk about data privacy and they instantly go to cybersecurity, they're really missing a they're only focusing on one third of the equation. The other two thirds are you need very robust policies and procedures in place, and you need a culture of privacy. You need all staff at all levels to be conscious of what the obligations are and and how they should be met. So that's what I mean by, by human error. I do find that everyone agrees, yes, we need rules, we need policies and procedures because everybody else needs them because they can't be trusted. But I'm special and I don't need to follow <laughs> And I that's human that nature. It is, yeah. That's human nature. Um, and, and that's what we've got to overcome. We can't control human nature, not very well. So what we have to do is put systems in place that wherever possible allow us to, you know, make sure that people are following, um, you know, the policies and procedures that we require them to, which is why you know, training is, is such a significant part of it, for sure. It sounds like it could be quite a high-stress area to work in. How do you unwind? Is there a way of unwinding? When you're sitting there going, oh. you know, 93% of these breaches happen this way, and I know what this organization, this organization's like, and oh my God, we're like two steps from society crumbling down behind us. How do you unwind from something like that? Well, first, first of all, I, I don't find it as stressful as maybe others do. I don't know why mm-hmm. it is. Um, because there, there is an element of... When I'm talking to a client, particularly in the early stages, I can tell their level of chagrin and embarrassment. They feel like we must be way behind everybody else. The reality is everybody has gaps in their privacy policies. It's just the nature of the world we live in. So from a pragmatic standpoint, I can appreciate that no one wants to invest one more cent more than they need to to comply with regulation. Mm-hmm. You know, if there's an ROI, you can get money forever. Um, but when it comes to governance, traditionally, there's been a, a real strong reticence. So I understand that. And, you know, I go in knowing there's going to be an ongoing conversation to be had about why this is important and, and so forth. However, in terms of how I relax, um, there's a couple of ways, really. I live up in the Blue Mountains of Sydney, so I'm very lucky that I've got a lot of bush walks available to me. So, you know, that's part of what I do. Uh, I very much like to, to read um, and uh, play video games on occasion as well. There's nothing quite like, you know, switching off your screen and then powering up another screen and disappearing into uh, yeah, exactly. Disappearing into the into a, a nice role playing game or a you know PVP arena and uh, gun down some strangers. You know. <laughs> um, in, in terms of books, what do you read? Uh, so I, I'm reading predominantly at the moment um, nonfiction. So I'm reading uh, Sapiens uh, mm-hmm. at the moment, which I'm I'm kind of enjoying, um, and I'm going down a bit of a rabbit hole on uh, complexity theory. Um, it's, you know, it's just one of those areas that piques my interest. Um, but also, you know, in terms of fiction, I'm a bit of a, a sci-fi uh, person, so I've just reread Peter F. Hamilton's um, uh, Pandora's Star, which is a amazing set of books. Uh, there's two books in the series. But, um, yeah, so I kind of go between a little bit of fiction and, and non-fiction. Um, but at the moment, it seems to be mostly the nonfiction stuff because there are topics I get a bit interested in. I go down a rabbit hole and uh, learn enough to be dangerous and then, you know, focus on something <laughs> else, you know. I know that feeling really well. Um, are you yeah. a book reader, like a paper book reader, or do you prefer tablets? Actually, audio books and paper. I'm not a tablet okay. guy. I, I tried that for a while, and it's useful, you know, when you're traveling and so forth. But, you know, there's nothing better, I find, than the, the, the tactile feeling of, of holding a book. I tend to absorb the information a lot better. But I do like audio books as well because, um, you know, particularly if I'm commuting into the city, uh, which is, you know, close to a two-hour trip sometimes, it's nice to have you know, an audio book at, at the ready. 
Um, and I often find audio books help me go to sleep. I've got a couple of books that I have on high rotation. You know, they're read by people that I think are engaging and I can you know, follow the story without being focused on it. And so my brain switches off and it, that helps me go to, go to sleep quite easily. So, you know. I find that with internet memes. Like, at uh, end of the day, I'll sit down and I'll just scroll websites that have just got random memes all through it and I find that helps my brain unwind. It, it just yeah. does something that switches it off to help me sleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, it's audio books sometimes, for sure. For sure. Do you follow any sports? Not a sport guy. No, never oh. have been. Um, yeah, I, you know, I'll, I'll watch an NFL game if I can catch mm-hmm. it. I enjoy watching, uh, NFL, but, um, it's not something I seek out and I'm certainly not going to pay the exorbitant amount of money it takes to subscribe to the NFL channels, uh, nowadays. Uh, but no, not really been a, been a sport guy, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, those, you know, I, I'm much more into theater, so I'd prefer to mm-hmm. go to, a you know, to a performance than uh, than I would to uh, to an arena and watch uh, watch sports. Not for me, I was, really. I was talking to someone yesterday who last year they went to their first ever league game, and they could they were from overseas. They couldn't work out which part of the league game was the national anthems. It's like I'm sure there were national anthems, um, but I, I don't know if you know the New Zealand national anthem particularly well. But it's boring. Like it, it, it's a church yeah. hymn that we've we've adopted and he actually thought it was a church thing when he was there <laughs> at, at the event he's like why am i here listening to people sing choral songs when i could do that in the church or i could go to a performance dance? i want to see the sports like yeah you know, it's yeah not, not everybody goes no, to the sports I, the it's it I, I i'm one of those people as well that i've curated my you know my website feeds and the algorithm so that I very rarely know when sporting events are on. Like the state of origin co- comes and goes, and it <laughs> wasn't really on my radar. So I often use that when I when I'm talking to people, particularly the the more non technical about you know to try and explain you know how the internet works and how these algorithms work is uh, is by that you know the 20 years ago. I couldn't help but live through the state of origin and every cricket game mm-hmm. and the World Series. You name it, you know. But nowadays, I think I only know the cricket's on because I happen to read the ABC News website and they still make <laughs> sure that, you know, headlines for some reason. But uh, no, I, I'm not really, a, yeah. I'm very lucky that I live in a world where I can just get the content I want. I had to laugh. I was talking to somebody who I know who works in media the other day and they deal specifically with the social media output of one of our major broadcasters. And they were saying the most common complaint that they get is people who don't like the use of Te Reo Māori, the, the native language for, for the indigenous Māori people here. And I'm like, do, do they not realize that the algorithm is feeding back every time they complain, every time they, they sit there and, and moan about something like this the algorithm picks up on that and feeds back more of the stuff you're complaining about because you're engaging with it and goes no no yeah. people don't care. they just want to complain that's yeah that that kind of makes sense that's what people like to do but no i uh i'm aware of of of, of those decisions to the point where now it it, we, it actually has resulted in arguments in our household <laughs> if my daughter logs into one of my you know, streaming services, you know, under my account, mm-hmm. then, yeah, I'll yell at her for messing with my algorithm. <laughs> uh, I haven't grounded my kids yet for it, but it's come damn close on occasion. Oh, I bet. I know what that's like. I, yeah, my kids don't touch my accounts. They've, they've got separate accounts. They can do what they want on their accounts, create yeah. their own algorithmic search results. But it is rather telling that my kids are well aware of what an algorithm is and how to exploit it and what it means, right? Yeah. Are they, I suppose, digital natives? That they'd be in that generation that's grown up with all of this? Yes, to varying degrees, though. My daughter is, uh, is you know, very comfortable with technology and utilizes it. Uh, my son is much more of a, he, he's just more of an out, he prefers to be outdoors in the sun, breathing fresh air, doesn't spend a lot of time. He's not a gamer very much loves to, you know, hang with his mates. That isn't to say that, you know, his mobile phone never leaves his side because it absolutely does, and that's his main line of communication with his friends. Um, so, yeah, very much they're comfortable with the role of technology, but it doesn't, um, 
Mm. Yeah, they use it in, in very different ways. And they seem to have a very realistic understanding of its benefits and its flaws as well. Um, you know, so I, I tend to get a bit um, uh, disappointed with the media and the hype that they tend to focus on because human nature still is human nature and you still need those connections. And, you know, I, I see my kids both going out, having very active social lives, uh, but it's facilitated and coordinated through technology. Um, but technology isn't the main thing that they do for sure. Right. One final question for you. Favorite piece of science fiction? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, you can't go much past the. For me, uh, as big a fan as I am of Star Wars, I have to say Star Trek is the thing that I, I tend to go back to. I find the ethos of Star Trek has a quite of a positive outlook on where mm -hmm. we might go. Um, yes, it's idealistic and a bit, you know, twee, but, um, you know, Next Generation for me was a, a huge part. And I'm a Doctor Who fan as well. Bottom line is it's just too difficult to say I've got yeah. a favourite one. Depends on depends on what mood I'm in. My, I, I, if I really had to come back and say the thing the, the thing that I get most uh, um, angry about is that they cancelled Firefly after one season. <laughs> uh, I absolutely loved that show. I thought it mm -hmm. was close to perfect. And I really don't understand why they why they got rid of it. Um, but I'm also, like I say, uh, that's on, that's only one media on on the on the reading side. There are so many good um, science fiction um, uh, novelists now that you know. I, I like the cyberpunk side. I like getting deep into the science. I think my favorite book is probably The Martian because it's all based upon realistic physics and science. Yes, it's an extreme. He takes some liberties. Hmm. But for the most part, it's a really well-constructed story that shows, you know, just what you can do if you, if you, if you know your stuff. So maybe that's what well, I land on is Martian. Speaking of those liberties, though, 10 years ago, nobody would have seen AI to the point where it is now and what it does now and how reliant we are on all sorts of things that people don't realize that we're reliant on. That's not to say that the Martian isn't a little bit ahead of its time and those liberties that it's taken aren't something that's going to be much more achievable by the time we get people on Mars. That's true. You know, that's true. Um, you know, and yeah, like I say, I think there'd be some people who would say, well, they did see AI coming. You look at Hal. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Arthur C. Clarke was, yeah, well ahead of his time. Absolutely, you know. Absolutely, yeah, I just sure. don't want. I don't want an AI that does what hell does. That would scare me. <laughs> I think we're a long way from that level of AI. I'd like to think I so, so anyway. Yeah. Certainly hope so. Yeah. Right, Richard. That's us done and dusted. Thank you very much for joining. Right. It's much appreciated. I will let you get back to the Blue Mountains. It's a beautiful part of the country that you're in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good to talk to you. Hey, I want to thank Richard again for joining me in this week's interview. Absolutely fascinating to see what led him to where he's at now and what some of his biggest influences have been when it comes to the work that he does. Now, the people who work in consulting actually raise a really interesting point of view and perspective when it comes to data management. After all, there's a lot of organizations out there that are trying to upgrade consistently or looking at new technologies like AI and ways to help them do what they do traditionally. And so when you have somebody who has big ideas but doesn't necessarily know how to go about dealing with them, you end up in sort of one of two camps. You end up with either people who don't know what they're doing, faking their way through it and trying to sort things out, and that often ends up really, really poorly, or you have to go and find experts who know what you're talking about and what you need, and they know what they're talking about because they're experts in the area. Which reminded me a little bit actually about this piece from a masterclass that we did back in 2022 uh, with Michael Orshimke from Scalefree, Knowles Eberson from Ignition, and Julian Redman from Ignition. They're talking really specifically here about what you need to do if you don't have an expert at hand when it comes to your data management and potentially any upgrades that you might have. So let's check in and watch that footage now.
Uh, what do you do when you don't have access to subject matter experts? Michael, why don't you start with that one? Okay. Um, I have two answers on this one. So let's say my preference is if at the client there are... So here's the thing. So I tell clients in a situation that you can give me budget and we are happy to burn it, but that wouldn't help you, right? So it's, that's not really of value. Um, so in the best case, what I'm doing is I'm trying to convince the client to really send in subject matter experts who know the data processes, uh, the, the business processes to help us to, to be successful, essentially. If that's not possible, my preferred choice, my second preferred choice is then, to find another project at the client where they have the budget and the subject matter experts available to help us essentially, because I, I really value the the um, presence of or the, the, the participation of subject matter experts in a project yep. that high, right? Um, so I, I rather would go for another internal project where they have the time to help us to to develop yep. all these features, these reports, and, and and so on. That's my that's my second preferred choice. And um, what I don't do is to, what I see some of the clients is they just create a role in the vault because they don't know what the, how the business will work with the solution they're building. And that's that's really burning money yeah. a lot. That's what I see. No, what do you have? Uh, so yeah, I, I always get the, yeah, great. You need a subject matter expert. So I agree wholeheartedly with Michael. If you don't have one, you need to agree with the business on what the impact would be. And the impact is this. I can become the subject matter expert. It's gonna take time, it's gonna take money. And then once we know what we're doing, it'll be quick to build a vault. But you can't not pay the piper. You have to become a subject matter expert. You, if you don't have one, you become one. And you have to pay school money. And school money is in money is in budget burned. So if the business cannot afford to spare the person, they have to spare the budget. So... Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Let me ask a uh, slightly, you know, drilling into that, I guess. Um, let's say that the organization has some very old applications and they don't have anyone who really knows those mm -hmm. anymore. Is there tools you can use, like the discovery tools and stuff, do enough or or can yes. you know, do you just have to spend the analysis time? How does that fit? Thou shalt not start data vault without profiling your data, okay? <laughs> that's a key yeah. command. So irrespective yeah. of whether I have the subject matter expert or not, you always profile the yeah. data. You start to understand how the data exists within the systems because what we understand and what the systems do is not necessarily always in sync. This is where the subject matter expert yeah. reaches that gap. You very rapidly get there. Now, there are some really good tools in the marketplace that does some of the discovery, but there is nothing in the marketplace that will discover that the investment choice for a person in a, in a pension fund is stored on the broker extension field called Broker Flag 07. There's nothing but a subject matter expert that eventually will tease out that kind of detail to it. Is it valuable? Absolutely. Is it foolproof? No. And so you then become the subject matter expert. Now, it's incumbent on you as the person engaged to bring the business to become the subject matter expert, that you do not perpetuate the sins of the past, and you must capture what you gather in a wiki, some sort of knowledge base or, or knowledge management platform that becomes part of the project collateral. Now, if you keep that all yeah. to yourself, you may have some job security, but eventually they'll fire you anyway. That's not what you want to do, right? You want to move on to more exciting stuff. So. Uh, Maintaining and managing a wiki is an absolute must as part of this process. Whether you have access to a subject matter expert or whether you have access to profiling or other discovery tools, that's fantastic, except you have to capture the decisions and the outcomes uh, and you need, you need to become a subject matter expert if you don't have one. And you need to make sure the business understands this. It's not a data vault problem. Yeah. It's a business resource problem. Two distinct things to keep in mind. Sure. Michael, anything else to add to that one? Uh, only a few topics or a few points. Um, the thing is that when you, we have these migration projects sometimes, and if you have a legacy system and there's, everybody's gone who built the system, who knows the system, well, then you have to, you have to pay the price. I mean, you have to really analyze the systems because we need to know how they work, what, how, how the data looks like and so on, right? There needs to be some source system analysis, essentially, or system analysis. That's what it is. I mean, 
the other option would be to have a wizard in a team, but there are no wizards. So that's, that's not an option. So it's really analyze the source system, analyze the system you want to play, replace. And that's what it is. It's, it's pure standard IT. And there's nothing even special about yeah, data yeah. here. It's, it's standard. And, and prototyping is your friend. Yeah. Prototyping is the friend because you have to then expose it to yeah. the business go, does this smell right? And they go, uh, no, it's supposed to look like this. You go, how is that possible? Yeah. And so off to the races, you go reverse engineering and figuring things out. Eventually, you'll get to the to the to the, mm -hmm. uh, the secret source there. But it takes time. It takes budget. And and I'm sure we've all seen these mm -hmm. projects that are very IT driven, and you know, and either the business doesn't want to engage or IT doesn't want to let them engage. And it, they always go slow and they're always hard, right? Because it is that subject matter expert. But let me add one final bit to this is in a, the data mesh paradigm where we're trying to have data products, do those SMEs become the data product owners? Is that kind of the idea? Is that how that works? So the ideal we'll product owners. With, yeah. yeah, perfect. Because right, they know what it is, question. they know the context, they know where it's supposed to happen or where it can't be used and where it should be used, all of those type of things. And they should capture that in their uh, interface agreement, their product uh, engagement model. So, yeah. Yeah. Right, that's it for this week's episode. I want to thank everybody who joined me, uh, including those guys that were involved in the Masterclass a couple of years ago now, but still really relevant information. And of course, Richard Harris for joining me for today's interview. It was absolutely brilliant to sit down and have a catch up with him. Don't forget you can like, share and subscribe this video or audio anywhere that you happen to be. Tell everybody about us. It'd be great. Bring them on board. And you can also join the conversation over at the Data Vault Innovators community, which is completely free to join. There's links in the bio. It's popping up on the screen right now. And don't forget, of course, to subscribe to everything that we're doing so that you can be kept in the loop. Until next week, have a fantastic week, and we will catch you guys all later. May the force be with you.